All right, so we'll make a start. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and, and thank you very much for coming along. Um, it's looking quite nice out there, actually. Um, it's a shame we can't do this outside, really. Um, so this is going to be quite an agile, agile workshop. Um, so what that means, really, is I want to get uh, you guys to kind of get the most out this day. It's, we've got quite a few hours until the party, so um, I want to try and make the most of it from there. So in order to do that, I need to kind of try and understand where you're all coming from uh, and what kind of experience uh, you've all got. And that's quite difficult with uh, nearly 40 people here. Um, so I'm just going to do a quick show of hands, see what kind of experience you've got. Um, and that kind of helps set the scene for the rest of the afternoon. So who, who's kind of from a development background, writes code most of the time? That's pretty much everybody. Who's never written a single line of code in their life? Oh, there's a couple. Who doesn't? Uh, is anybody of those two people that stick their hands up, do you object to writing any code? I if object to it. I'm, I'm interested in the project methodology. Okay, right, okay. Right, okay. Um, so, uh, again, one of the options, we've got quite a few options of things we can do. Uh, and so, um, again, that's a very agile kind of thing. So it'll be up to you to kind of give me feedback about what you want to do with this time as well. Um, so has anybody used uh, things like extreme programming before? Is anybody familiar with those practices? Almost nobody? Great, I can talk about that. Um, Scrum? Who loves Scrum? There's a few people. Um, and anybody used Kanban before? Nobody? Oh, excellent. I could talk about that, about that for hours then. That's great. Um, and so, let's see. Um, what, I, what I'm going to try and do is get you to work in your tables as well, so you can kind of learn from me. Because if I just stand here for five hours talking to you, I'll bore the pants off you. Um, I'll bore the pants off myself. And I want to make sure that uh, you're kind of sharing your own experiences as well. So we'll kind of have uh, sessions where I'll start talking about something, and I'll set you an exercise to go and like talk about those kind of ideas and issues in your own groups, and then uh, each kind of table can kind of summarise what you've been talking about, uh, and then we'll move on to the next kind of topic. Does that sound okay? Because if you want to do something different, you have to tell me. Um, so. What I plan to do is kind of give you just a general agile introduction at first, uh, and, uh, and then we'll talk about mainly about um, extreme programming, uh, and um, because everything kind of in agile leads on from the work that was done to define extreme programming. Uh, and as most of you have a development background as well, then that kind of relates uh, a lot closer to what you're doing. But also, some of you will kind of experience Scrum and, and Kanban as well, and we'll talk about the different kind of aspects, why you would kind of do one or the other, what's the, the good points, the bad points, how people use them and abuse them, and quite a lot about how they abuse them as well. Um, some people use Scrum as a very positive uh, way to introduce Agile, but can also use it in a very kind of command and control way. Uh, so we'll be talking about the culture of things, uh, and along the way I'll try and show you um, some things about what Alassian are doing, although I'm not really going to talk much about, our, our, I'm not going to talk about our products or anything, I'm just going to talk about some of our cultural aspects and how we've used some of the agile techniques to uh, help the way we do things. Okay, now if the internet's working, uh, I might be able to start talking about XP, um, there we go. Um, so, rather than do slides, so I think slides are kind of a bit boring. Uh, if you've got laptops, you can go to my blog, which is uh, uh, jrocket.com, and it's a rocket with a zero rather than an O. Somebody beat me to the domain. Uh, but please don't steal all my Wi Fi bandwidth, please. So, everything we're kind of be covering probably is going to be on my blogs uh, or I'll give you some web resources as well to, to go look at. There's also some really interesting resources uh, on the Alassian site as well and, I, and I'll kind of highlight some other really interesting stuff. Um, that's why it's loading. Uh, has anybody come across the, the idea of lean startup as well? Yeah, a few. So we kind of touch on those aspects as well. It's a very exciting um, kind of ideas and it kind of builds on especially the Kanban stuff that we'll talk about. 
Uh, it all kind of builds up from there as well. It's very similar ideas. Uh, okay. Uh, bum -dum -dum. Oh. Uh, there we go. Woo. So, I don't know if anybody's seen the, the movie called Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. It's a very weird, uh, very weird movie. Uh, Johnny Depp uh, and Benito Del Toro. Basically, these two guys are stunned off their heads going on this road trip to uh, Las Vegas. And it kind of reminds me of like some of the projects I've had to deal with. Uh, it, it, nobody has a clue what they're doing. Everybody's kind of off running around everywhere. Uh, it's usually kind of like total anarchy. And... Um, it's it's just kind of some of the worst projects I've been on. Of, of, of nobody really knows why they're doing things. They're just doing them and uh, going through the motions. Um, so when you come to actually try and move away from that, move away from the the Nike kind of just do it kind of approach, um, there's lots of different options. You can go for waterfall, and um, there's uh, it's really interesting that um, there's a guy called Royce defined the waterfall process. Very simply, you're all familiar with waterfall, unfortunately, yes. Um, and so on page two, he described how it works. You go from analysis to design to, um, to delivery and so on. So step by step, you do each piece of work all up front uh, and then move it on to the next one. Uh, what most people didn't realize was that on the page three, he said that this doesn't work. The, the waterfall approach doesn't actually work. Um, don't use it, or if you are going to use it, put some feedback into that process. Uh, unfortunately, not many people got to page three, uh, and especially um, um, some of the big projects, they adopted waterfall, uh, and, and basically it causes a lot of boundaries and a lot of barriers to appear in your organization, in your teams. People will do, that's my bit, now it's your problem. Uh, and so there's a lot of book passing. So the Agile people came up with um, a lot of practices to try and uh, try and move away from this in a, in a kind of more structured way. So one of the things uh, over a decade ago that was defined was extreme programming, and they have a saying that uh, if if something's worth doing, it's worth doing well. I assume you've all heard of that phrase before. So their idea is if something's valuable in the software development uh, process, if it's an activity that's important then let's do it really well let's make sure we're, we're making the most out of that technique so one example that's often used is unit unit testing so if you're going to unit test some of your code why not test it all um, if it's really good for helping you not just test your code but design the code as well well why don't we do it up front so we can actually think about the design before we write the code does anybody do this kind of approach already Yay, thank you, a few. Uh, so it, it's certainly, when people start doing this, it's a very aspirational thing. People want to kind of, they want to write tests for the code, but they often write the tests side by side or after the code. Uh, what that's really meaning is that instead of doing test-driven development, you're, you're writing tests for something you've already made a decision on. Because the, the tests really are there to help you kind of understand what it is you're trying to deliver, uh, how you should design your system, what, what the behavior is, uh, and then you can very easily code a solution to that problem because you've investigated it further. So one of the main things about extreme programming is this idea of unit testing, test first, test driven development. Uh, so a lot of people would call that TDD. And so then you, you take a problem, you break it down, and by creating all these unit tests, you're actually defining specific things, specific behavior, that then you can just write some code for to satisfy it. So it's very, uh, it gets people thinking about what they're writing before they're actually writing it when it comes to code. Um, it, it's, it is to, as a developer myself, I know it's very easy to think, get excited about a new technology or a new, new project, you start bashing some code out, and that's great, but when you kind of look at it and three weeks later you think, why did they do that? It's horrible. Or, or the decisions you, decisions you make then are not necessarily the relevant ones you need now, so you have to go around and refactor everything. Uh, and so having that sort of extra step to get you thinking about the, the responsibility and the behavior of your code before you write it is really invaluable. 
So that's why they encourage you to do test-driven development as one of the core parts of extreme programming. Uh, Uh, so, oop, doop, doop. so one of the other aspects um, of extreme programming is pairing. Has anybody done pairing before? Um, if you're up for some coding, then we can do some pairing uh, this afternoon to just to break up the uh, the evening. There's something called a cyber dojo, which uh, again you, you can kind of do some pair programming together, or you can group up into three or four people, uh, and then uh, try and develop something uh, together. And the advantage of pair programming is really uh, you're sharing each other's knowledge. So you're not, when you're writing a bit of code, when you're doing some unit tests, then um, you can do it by yourself, but then it's only your knowledge. You're not using somebody else's. You can go off and talk to somebody else. Often when you have a problem or when you have a bug, you get somebody to come along and help you find it. So why not do that all the time? Why not get them there? up front so you don't actually write that bug in the first place. That's one of the aspects of uh, a pair programming. But also, when you're doing a new project, and all projects are going to be new, otherwise why would you do it, um, then there's a problem domain. You're actually trying to understand what it is you're building. Now, you can do that again by yourself, or you can use somebody else's help uh, and actually get a, a, a more wider view of what it is you're trying to build. So pairing isn't just about writing code, sitting one person's there sitting there typing while the other person is watching. These are two people having discussions, sharing their understanding, sharing their experiences to help them create this piece of code. So and traditionally in Waterfall, everybody kind of separates out into, so you've got one person, one developer writing in isolation and a whole desk full of developers all writing by themselves, uh, and they're not sharing any information, they're not sharing what they're doing. So when you come to integrate all that code, it's a lot harder. If somebody needs to work on somebody else's code, then you need to spend time explaining what that does. Um, so if you put pairing in at the front, then you're actually saving time because you, you're sharing that information. Everybody knows a lot more about what the code does, a lot more about what the system does, and a lot more about where, where you're actually trying to go overall in the project. So it's actually, while some people think it is a big expense, it's actually a huge cost saving. Because if somebody gets run over by a bus, somebody doesn't turn up and you need to change anything, somebody else knows exactly how that code works. They know what to change, when to change it, and so on. So they have a better understanding of the system. Does that make sense? Cool. Um, just making a nod just to make sure you're still awake. So that's good. Um, uh, so there's a, I don't know if this is going to work because there's a, the uh, internet's not very fast, but um, there's a it's kind of an interesting um, video um, that we did, uh, basically, because some people are very nervous about uh, pair programming. Uh, they're very wary about kind of sitting down next to somebody when they're actually coding. It's, uh, it's a very creative thing and people can get very uh, sensitive about their creative abilities. They feel very <laughs> concerned that, the, that somebody else might criticize their code. Uh, and it's not about picking fault. It's not about seeing somebody spelling mistakes. It's about helping them to do the best code that they can actually do. So when two people get together, they're, they're acting as a one person. Uh, rather than two people uh, criticizing each other. Uh, this might not work. I'm not sure how good the uh, internet is. But that might be homework for you. Uh, okay. Um, so it's a really good activity. Um, and you don't have to do it all the time. Uh, although extreme programming kind of encourages you to do everything valuable all the time, you don't have to do everything all the time. Uh, because it, pairing can be quite an intensive experience. Uh, and if you've never done it before, then don't just decide to, we'll do it all the time, because it is very, um, it is hard work. Uh, it is kind of uh, hard, it's very hard to kind of get used to 
preparing initially because it is very different to what we do because normally when we're at school when we go through education we're told to work on our own not to look at the answers at the back of the book we have to go and, uh, and deliver it for ourselves but when you actually get into work you don't do that it's completely the opposite so we're actually trained to do things in the wrong way at school um, so when you actually get out into work you should collaborate because that's how you make sure you're not making mistakes uh, because most of the projects we work in are full of uncertainties full of things that change uh, I'm sure everybody's experienced the fact that you've done some work and then somebody changes the requirements and you have to redo an awful lot yes that's a common thing um, but that's a natural thing and you actually want people to be able to change um, what they want because their business is going to change as well so a lot of the agile stuff is about being able to have the flexibility to do what you want and the better you actually understand what you're trying to achieve the more flexibility you actually have the more scope you have to be able to change the direction of the project because uh, everybody can see what it was so it's much easier to go in a slightly different direction is there any questions so far? No? oh, one at the back Mm -hmm. Then pairing, how do you distill the knowledge down of what is what you want? Yes. To then build that instead of just two developers saying this is what we want. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's a, a really good point. That changes completely. It is a really good project. Yeah. And if it's an internal project, mm -hmm. then pairing works. This is the purpose behind what we're building. Yeah. Then you use your stories and you get all that motion going. Mm -hmm. But perspectives immediately change when what you want is outside your build team. Yes. Yes. Uh, and you've hit the nail on the head. I mean, it, this is a problem that some people have when they're adopting Agile. They think it's just for the development team, but it's actually Agile is not, uh, the Agile practices are for the whole organization, the whole kind of system that you're working in. And that might include your company, it'll include all your customers, all the different kind of stakeholders that there are in your organization. These people are all involved and should be all involved in the Agile process that you're you're trying to introduce into your company. So to get to your specific point, um, if you have um, a customer or somebody who's uh, part of the business and working there outside of the development team, there's nothing to stop you actually getting them to come along and pair with you. It doesn't have to be two developers. In fact, if all you're doing is pairing developers with developers, then you're limiting what they can learn. One of the best ways to get more testable code is to pair a developer with a tester. That way they're sharing uh, different experiences, different ideas, uh, and this all often leads to code that has less bugs and is more testable uh, and is more robust to change. Um, and also doing it with a product owner. So one of the uh, aspects uh, of extreme programming that they, that they talk about is not just having a customer access to a customer, but having that customer actually on site, actually sitting with the development team or in easy reach of the development team. So they, we'd all be in a room, we'd have several development teams, uh, and we'd have several customers working away at their business, but at any time, the developers could go and ask them questions. Or even as we've said, they could pair together. I know quite a few uh, companies that, um, in the financial sector, in the trading sector, the traders don't really have much time. But when they do have time, they'll come and sit with the developers and say, I want this, 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 this. They know exactly what they want, and they can sit down with a, within 20 minutes of sitting down with a developer. They can completely change the, some major aspects of what they're trying to do, and the developer can finish it all off for them. And it's a very, very productive kind of way of, of, of actually getting uh, new features and changes into the system because you've got those two people that matter, somebody who knows what they need and somebody who's able to deliver that working hand in hand to get them something done. So that's a really kind of the extension of where extreme programming goes. Um, so initially a lot of the material talked about the development team but it also talks about the customers as well and some people kind of forget that but it's a very important aspect. Uh, 
Oh, yep, yeah, sorry. Sorry. Is this all right? Uh, you were mentioning TD off the bat. I find it still more of a BDD approach. I know it's kind of TDD 2.0. It's more of like an outside in perspective. Yes. Where everything's controlled by the UI, so that is your interface into anything that regards the TDD is in yep. place for. Yeah. Um, well, it's an interesting point. Uh, I mean, I, I am familiar with BDD as well. We can cover those aspects. It is, uh, I, I kind of want to start at the basics and bring everybody up. Uh, but yeah, certainly those, uh, I see BDD is an evolution of TDD, domain-driven design, uh, and, and neuro-linguistic programming, and quite a few other things as well. And that's, um, but we'll get to that uh, soon enough. Uh, was there another question there? There's, uh, there's an interesting, whenever anybody asks anybody who's like an agile practitioner, one thing they say when they get asked the question is it depends on the context. Um, and so I'm going to use that answer to you. Um, not because it's a cop out, but it does really make a huge difference actually. Why are you doing pairing? Are you pairing to get a product complete because you want to deliver it to the customer to get feedback? If you're doing that, then you probably want developers of a similar level that can work together very quickly to get something done. That's probably what you want. If you're um, wanting to make sure that if you want to like, onboard people, then yes, like pairing uh, a, a new developer with an experienced developer is a great way for them to share uh, and, and kind of learn from each other. So it, it's kind of, you, you want to kind of what's, what's going to give you the best value. And um, it's, uh, it, it, it is all down to context, really, so there's lots of different things. Does that answer your question? Yeah, cool. I appreciate after asking you that. Um, yeah, sure. And, um, it, but there is lots of different things you can get out of these techniques. And again, these are not um, recipes that are fixed and, and hard, and you must do step one, step two, step three. These are tools and principles and ideas that you can use and it start introducing to them to what you're doing already. So it doesn't matter how you're working initially, that's the way you work. That's the reality of what you're doing. And if you see one of these techniques that you think you can use, try and introduce it, see if it works, evaluate it. If you've got some way to measure how it works as well, it's easier to introduce. But that also kind of means measuring what you're currently doing as well which you might not want to do because you might find out how good or bad it is. Uh, and it is, it is quite scary. It's quite scary uh, kind of introducing Agile into your organization, into your team, because you do start to see all the things that you kind of try and cover up uh, naturally because of the, uh, the, this kind of system you're actually working in. Um, OK. Um, so another really interesting aspect of extreme programming is um, this idea of collective code ownership. So I assume we're all using version control systems these days. Anybody not using a version control system? Anyone who not want to admit to using a version control system? Um, so collect, uh, code ownership <coughs> is more about just putting everything in subversion or gifts. It's actually having uh, a shared responsibility for the quality and the design and the behavior of that code. Uh, it's shared responsibility for whether you've done tests and how many tests you're actually doing. <coughs> Some teams get really carried away with and really concerned by the amount of code coverage they have for their tests. So how many tests, how much of their code is actually covered by the tests they've written? And there are tools like Clover and so on that will actually tell you how much of your code is being tested by JUnit or, or whatever unit testing framework you've got. Um, that, that's really useful measurement, but it doesn't actually tell you how good those tests are, whether they're actually meaningful, whether they're just kind of testing if one plus one equals two, that's not really a good test. 
uh, whether they're actually speaking about what the business actually needs. That's what the tests should be about. So that is all part of sort of code ownership. Actually understanding uh, and, sh and collectively caring about what you've created as a group, not just somebody caring about what they've done, their own piece of code. It's not really about, this isn't really ego-driven development, this is uh, you working as a team and that team should be as big as possible. Um, so with, with things like uh, uh, distributed version controllers, anybody use Git or Mercurial? Yeah, a few people, cool. So again, that makes it even easier to sh kind of share code and exchange code. So it, you, again, it's, a, it's another great way to learn from each other by sharing stuff, by getting involved in other people's projects, by contributing in, in a small way. One of the things that we do at Atlassian is uh, we have 20% time, uh, which is 20% of our time is set aside for our own projects, for, for things that we think of doing, things that we think is valuable to the business. So it might be something that we experience all the time, it's like a, something that's missing from a product, we want to fix it, uh, or something, or some new feature that we would think was really great. So we can kind of start working on those and set up our own uh, Git repository and, inc and invite other people to kind of have a look at it and then contribute ideas and collectively we can do a lot more together than we would do just by one person doing it by themselves. So the distributed version thing really helps kind of get people sharing code and, and then you, once you start sharing code you take more responsibility for that code because it's not just yours, it's somebody else's as well. Uh, mentioned uh, on-site customer. So a very interesting uh, company called uh, Cyber Media. They're in uh, Germany, and um, I've seen a few other companies in the UK like this. They they will actually they won't take on a project unless they can actually get a customer on site, because it's not worth it for them. They they know there's a, a much bigger risk of that project failing if the customer isn't there. If they don't have access to it, then the developers are just sitting there twiddling their thumbs because well, we don't know what to do, the customer's not there, uh, or we're busy away, we've created all these uh, user stories, created some lovely code, uh, the customer's been away for weeks, and then they come back and they've just changed their mind. They've changed their mind about what they wanted to do and what was their priority, so the last three, four weeks, well, they don't want to pay for because they want something else now. And so if you don't have a connection to the person telling you what they want, the person paying for the project, if they're not there all the time, then the risk will grow bigger. Uh, and um, again, some companies are, especially consultancy companies, are, are really kind of pushing away from that. They want the customer on site or they will actually ship the whole development team to the customer's site and uh, ensure that there is really good access to the people who know how things work. Uh, are we all fami familiar with user stories? A few people. Um, again, they're called quite different things. People come across use cases before. You can think of user stories as um, kind of just the titles of use cases. User stories really are, they're not requirements documents because uh, nobody really likes 50 page, 150 page requirement documents. They're a bit boring and tedious to uh, read, never mind write. Um, so what extreme programming encourages is you to define everything as a user story. So you will actually um, say define a feature and just say the the product should do X. Uh, the product should be, I should be able to go to, uh, and uh, say you're writing an ATM uh, product, I should be able to go to the cash point, put my car uh, and withdraw 50 pounds. And that would be a very basic user story. And then the team would kind of have a, co uh, a, com uh, a the, the team would have a, a, I've forgotten the word now, a conversation, that's the one. Um, it's been a long day already. So the team would have a conversation uh, about that user story. Uh, and again, that, that's where they really need somebody from the business, somebody who understands uh, how uh, the financial transactions around that kind of work. Because if you go to a cash point and withdraw 50 pounds, that seems pretty straightforward. 
but then what if you don't have 50 pounds in your account do we tell you not to do we tell you to go away do we be nice to you and say okay well did we give you 50 pounds and then charge you a fortune for it uh, which is more likely um, do we uh, offer them a lesser figure do we tell them how much money they've actually got and allow them to make a decision about how much they want to uh, withdraw so it does kind of lead on to uh, a really interesting conversation uh, and it's a conversation that the the team who are going to develop the software can understand the domain that they're working in and more importantly the customer can understand what it is they really need because customers know what they want but don't often have the luxury to explore what they actually need uh, and there's a big difference there because you, if you look at something like Microsoft Word do you actually need all the things that are in Microsoft Word? Do you even know what they all are? Because I don't. But if you, if you ask me what I, what I actually need, there's maybe five things uh, from, from Word that I use. I, I need to be able to type in text, I need to be able to format it, I need to be able to print it out and maybe email it. So there's, there's not much I actually need, but then there's a whole load of stuff in there. Uh, and all that stuff gets in the way. And the more code there is, the more bugs there are, because there is a relationship. The more code you write, the, m the more of a risk there are that you're introducing bugs uh, into that system. So having uh, conversations around the user stories, you find out which are valuable, uh, which ones you want to do first. So you're, it goes into the whole planning activity of extreme programming. Defining user stories helps you shape how you're going to do things, which things you're going to do first, uh, why you're doing them. Uh, and having that conversation, again, it's important to know why you're doing things, not just for the customer, but for the developers. Because again, if something changes, then they know why things are changing. They, they have a more affinity to that code that they're um, developing and they, they take more responsibility for that code. It's not just something they're doing 9 to 5, it, it's part of what they want to create. Um, and a useful technique uh, to help with um, use, uh, user stories is something called personas. So persona is, um, I, I guess you've always you've seen uh, in some of the cartoons, some, somebody draws a caric caricature of somebody, or you see in spitting image, then they kind of they take a few elements of somebody uh, and and really emphasize those kind of things. Um, so that's what you're doing with personas. You find you find identify users in the system. Uh, so um, you might have uh, a persona called Joe Public who goes to the cash point and, and withdraws money. And you can define what Joe Public does. He might be, yeah, he might earn, earn uh, 30,000 pounds a year. He might um, spend a lot of money on, on X, Y, Z. You kind of define the whole caric caricature of this person. So when you're thinking about the system that you're actually building, you can then, um, you can then have some context, some wider context to, again, ex elaborate on that conversation around the user story. So it really does help fire up your imagination to decide what's important and what's not important. Uh, so we talked about acceptance tests, uh, sorry, unit tests, uh, but there's also this idea of acceptance tests, which kind of were the forerunner of sort of behavior-driven development that we'll kind of touch on later on this afternoon. So. Acceptance tests really are kind of a layer above unit tests. So unit tests are geared around helping you understand and create the code. Uh, acceptance tests are helping, again, it's another tool to help you understand uh, what it is that is needed from the system. So what does the customer actually want? Distill that in a user story and then expand that into an acceptance test. So what you're trying to do is, again, just make sure you've got that understanding and be able to actually have some kind of way to link that understanding to the code you're going to develop. So in essence, you, um, um, I feel I want to uh, draw something, let's see. So we have the, the customer. Uh, and so with the development team, you uh, 
create a whole series of user stories. And um, so you have initial conversations throughout that. You would prioritize which ones go where um, and decide which ones to start working on at first. And then you create your iteration, your, your first um, set of work you're going to do to be able to deliver something. And um, from that, you can create, uh, you take a user story and, and write an acceptance test. Uh, which kind of goes through sort of different scenarios that you're actually going to experience in that user story uh, and set criteria about when that user story is satisfied. So again, go back to the ATM example. Uh, you can define um, an acceptance test for what I'll actually get if I'm doing, if I withdraw 50 pounds, if I withdraw 20 pounds. You can define what actually happens at each of those um, situations. Uh, an acceptance test uh, and then the developers can take that and link that to uh, the source code that they write uh, and as they're developing that source code you can link that back to the acceptance test and the developers know when they feel that they've, they can have a test to see when they've actually completed that work so they kind of know when they're done it's one of the challenges is how do you know you've actually developed the right kind of software so with acceptance tests, you're actually showing um, some more evidence that you actually completed what it was that was needed. And so if you do an acceptance test for all of your user stories, then again, you can see you've got a link from all of these requirements. You've got tests to see whether you've done the code that satisfies the customer. And the customer can also have an idea about how the project is progressing. So you don't have to break out your Gantt chart. You can actually see from the work you're actually doing, from this understanding that you're building, you can see how far you're actually getting, what progress you're actually making. And um, again, it makes it a lot more easier to kind of reprioritize the work as well. Uh, question? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I do prefer um, the, the Gherkin language, the given, then, when. And we'll, we'll cover some examples of that later on so everybody can kind of know what we're talking about. But, um, but yeah, it, it basically is uh, you're defining a, a whole collection of scenarios, like you would do with kind of use cases as well, uh, but more specifically. Uh, and in, with, uh, with behavior-driven development, you're, you have basically a template that you're using. Uh, a, a structure, a, a more formal structured um, natural language than just natural language. Because natural language can be quite vague, whereas if you're using this Gherkin language, which is given you have some kind of uh, situation, um, uh, when something happens, then you should get this outcome. So it's defining that in a very kind of structured way, and you define all your acceptance tests in that way. Uh, so that everybody can understand it because it's a shared, the business people can understand it, technical people can understand it, but then they can also use that to verify their code, just like they would do with a unit test. It's amazing, it's amazing stuff. Um, it's a bit hard to kind of visualize it until you've done it, but um, it does really help. Uh, you, you can get kind of, instead of just getting code coverage, you actually get acceptance test coverage of all your code you're developing, and you can see where you're done. Um, some developers actually use it to, to know what to do next. Uh, so they might have the testers helping them write the acceptance tests, because it doesn't have to be developers or business people. Testers can also get involved in this. Uh, and it's often better when they do, because again, it makes more testable code. Uh, so. 
having the acceptance test, you get that traceability through, and you can see where you're done. Uh, and see if somebody writes a new acceptance test, you can see, oh, that's ready. I'll go and write some code against that. Uh, you can see the acceptance test, and off you go. And then you can run the acceptance test uh, through and see if it passes, see if you've got more work to do or not, uh, or see if the, uh, the test is met. OK? Is this all making sense? You're very quiet. Uh, um, so I've just got a few more other things, and then um, I'll try and get you to do some exercise stuff. Uh, okay. Uh, small releases. Um, so just get your brains thinking again. Um, for the projects that you work on, um, how long is a typical project? Not that there is a typical project, but are you, do you do projects in terms of weeks? Uh, is it months? Is it years? Weeks? Who does like three, four weeks projects? A few people, oh, quite a few people. Who spends at least two months kind of doing a project? Oh, it's the same people. Um, and who's, who's done a project that lasted more than a year? Oh, okay. That's a big one. Does anybody of those people work for government or public sector? Yeah, yeah there we go. <laughs> that's, not, uh, that's not unusual. Um, do we ever get any problems with long projects? Has anybody ever heard any uh, problems in the news about long projects and how expensive they are? And so you yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and if you're looking at agile very skeptically, you can think, "Well, that's really all we're doing," because in essence, we're still doing analysis, we're still doing design, we're still doing um, testing, hopefully, sometimes not. Um, and so we're still doing the, the same things, it's just the approach to all these, these things, and it's the, uh, it's the, the ideas and, and the way we're doing it, and the, the way we kind of want to do it more collaboratively, and the way we try and break things down into smaller pieces. So the idea of small releases, oh, good. Okay, yeah. Well, there you go. There's a, there's a nice uh, experience report there. Uh, and so, um, yeah, it does. I mean, it, these uh, you get big projects. You're always going to have um, ambitious goals that you want to achieve as, a, as an organization. So it, it is kind of breaking those things down, decomposing those things to, okay, what's the most simplest thing we can actually do next? And so all the agile practices kind of talk about this. Uh, what's the... What's the smallest thing we can actually deliver? And when you, when you talk about uh, lean startups, they think about um, sort of the minimum viable product that they can actually ship out. What's the, what's the smallest thing we can actually give to people that they will actually pay for? So, and this, so this is nothing new. So small releases, um, you can plan all you want, but it, until you actually deliver something, you don't know if people want it. Uh, even if you kind of demo it, they'll think, oh yeah, that's nice, maybe change that color. But in, until they actually have to use it day in, day out, you don't know for definitely if they're going to want to, if they're going to want to accept it. Um, I worked on a project, uh, an insurance company. They spent about 150,000 uh, on this new product. Uh, they spent, it took them uh, about three months more than they actually planned for um, and it was about 80,000 more than I actually budgeted for uh, and when they came to deliver it they got two people to use it out of 700 uh, and the only way they could make more people use it was by making it their default homepage and they still wouldn't use it uh, and it took them 
another two months to actually get to make people to use it because they eventually took the, other, the old system away. Uh, some people left, uh, and, but they'd invested so much in this thing that they, they couldn't say, oh, well, let's just throw it away. So there is a real risk and a real danger of, of doing too much um, uh, without giving it to the people who are actually going to use it. So having some very small releases stops an awful lot of waste. It stops an awful lot of risk because if you're if you put uh, a pound on the uh, on the uh, what was the horse race at the weekend, the Grand National. Thank you. Uh, so if you put a pound on the Grand National, you're only going to lose a pound, but you might win an awful lot. If you put ten thousand pounds on it, then you're going to lose an awful lot. Um, so the more you invest in something before you see the results, the more risky that investment actually is. Uh, and everything's kind of investment for the customer. They they want this new product, and if it's they have to go, if they have to wait for three months to get it, things might change, their ideas might change, their business might change. There might be another competitor that's already doing it, so you've you've been beaten to to market. Somebody else has, has created something you can just buy off the shelf for fifty pounds. You've just spent like hundred thousand on this product that you don't need anymore. So if you release it, if you spend a week or two weeks and ship something, then you get instant, you get feedback on it, and you know if you're going in the right direction. Uh, it also is very easy for the that the person who's using it to start using it. There's not much to learn; they can start using it straight away, and they can get some benefit out of it. The real trick about small releases is working out what's the most important thing that they need right now. What's the one thing that I can actually give them? that will help them do some do more work than they're currently doing or be more productive than they currently are. So that's why you go through the whole kind of uh, user story. Really having all those conversations should help you understand what's the most important next step. And that's really kind of the agile way, really. The agile way of trying to understand what's important to give to somebody. And if you do it and then give it to them, then that validates it you have a much smaller feedback cycle than you would do normally. And um, if you built the right thing, you can keep on building it. If you built something that's not right, you can either throw it away or change it. Uh, and that's much less risk and much less expense than there would be spending three months. Even three months is, is too long, really, uh, to, to wait for feedback. Um, Uh, there's a very nice quote from, uh, if you remember, Storm in Norman Watch goes says, like, plan never survives the war. You can plan something, but as soon as you put it into effect, it's going to change. And that's the same thing with most things. It's very hard to actually plan in the future. We, we can't predict the future. We can't predict what's going to happen tomorrow. Well, apart from the DB conference, hopefully. hopefully. Um, uh, and I'm just going to talk about estimation, and then we'll do something to get you moving and stop you falling asleep and <laughs> stuff like that. So, who does estimation? Who, who enjoys doing estimation? <laughs> well, we know you do, because you do it right away. Um, it's, it's a very black... It's a, some of you developers, you get asked to do estimation. How painful is that? Very painful. Um, and why is it painful? Um, it's very hard to figure out the end without spending a significant amount of money. Yeah. All the edge cases. Yeah. I mean, the reason uh, we can't estimate is because if we're going to do, if we're going to create some new software, it's new. It's a new project. If it was something that already existed, we wouldn't need to create it. If it's something we've already done, we wouldn't need to create it. The way you can estimate something is by being based on your own experience. So unless you're doing something almost identical, there's a lot of new uncertainty in that project. So how do you estimate it? How do you estimate something you don't know? I mean, I could estimate, I could ask you, how long was it going to take me to walk from here to Central Station? And what would you say? 15 minutes? That's what it says on uh, the Jury Inn website, so that's quite a good estimate. But then what if the, the Gateshead Bridge is raised? 
what if um, there's, there's a march down the, the central station, the, the road to the central station? There's all these kind of uncertainty kind of elements that could creep into the project that you have no idea about. If you've never done it before, then it's hard for you to understand what all those uncertainties are. Um, there's a very nice quote from uh, Donald Rumsfeld. Um, there's known knowns, there's unknown knowns, there's, uh, and so on and so on. So there's, there's things you don't know that you don't know in most projects. So how do you estimate? Well, you can't. Well, you can, but they're estimates. Estimates are not promises. And so I've got another article uh, here. I don't know if it loads or not. Um, uh, called Estimates Are Not Promises. Uh, oh, there we go. Hey. One I've already loaded already. Um, so a lot of the time, estimates are like this. You're, you've got your BB gun and you're just firing at a target. You don't really know. You're just kind of making a guess. Because estimates are a guess with a certain level of experience attached to it. If you're doing a very new project, there's hardly any experience because you've only got the experience of how good a developer you are, how good the team is, how good somebody is at um, understanding requirements and so on. There's these kind of elements to take into consideration. If it's a new customer, then you have no experience about how good they are at explaining what they want, how much they'll interact with you, how long you're going to have to go back and have lots more conversations with them. Uh, never mind actually understanding the problem domain, if that's new as well. So if a project manager comes up to you and says, OK, we're going to create a Gantt chart and we're going to estimate everything out, it's all going to be guesses. The, the less you know, the more of a guess it is. And, and it becomes very difficult. Uh, and so you may as well just get your Nerf gun out and start shooting a target. So there are techniques that people do use. Um, and um, so some people use planning poker. People, have people used that before? Yeah. Did you find that useful? So for me, uh, the planning poker, the most useful thing about planning poker is not deciding on the story points. It's the actual conversation you have to decide how big something is. So with planning poker, you'll get right, you'll have your stories, uh, and as a team, you'll you'll put a story down, and everybody will kind of put a card down, um, thinking to say how many story points or uh, it is. So is it uh, is it two story points? It'll take a couple of days. Is it is it five story points? It'll take a week. Is it like twenty story points? It'll take forever. Um, and the idea is, as a team you will decide how big a story is, how much effort is required to kind of do that story. And in order to do that, you need to have a conversation. So you will either uh, you'll discuss as a team, you might even get the, the product owner involved or somebody from the business involved who will actually be able to explain things to you. You might not know, so you might have to put that to a side. Say, well, we just don't know. We can't estimate that. Um, or so you might find something's too big. And again, you can you can consider whether you actually want to break that uh, that story down into several stories. Um, the only kind of downside I see people getting involved with planning poker is they get caught up in the actual numbers, uh, and uh, so people argue whether something's three or five points. I mean, that's that's kind of just call it five and get on with it. Um, it's the numbers really aren't important. Initially, it's the discussions about understanding what's actually involved. And also, it's a great way to actually understand the rest of the team as well. Because if somebody's saying that story is going to take me seven and everybody says it's going to be one point, then what are they thinking about? Like, ask them to elaborate. Is it, is it just that they don't know how to do that? Or is it that they see lots of problems that you're not seeing? Again, it's a great opportunity to kind of bring all these things out uh, and, and see what the kind of unknowns are. Um, I try and encourage people to use um, t-shirt sizes or something like that rather than points because, again, points don't mean prizes. It's, it's not Bruce Forsyth, but they, people kind of relate points to days uh, and um, we're not trying to kind of give ourselves a rod on our back to, uh, to we're not trying to say, well, okay, this will definitely take a day. We're trying to kind of understand the relative sizes of each of these uh, pieces of work 
so we can kind of give better estimation about when we can get them done, how long they would actually take. Um, so it doesn't matter if something is like um, a point or two points, but if something is two point, if something is like ten points, then it's a big difference from something that's one point. If something is a small T-shirt, then uh, compared to a large T-shirt, then they should be a lot quicker to do. And it's up to the team to kind of decide really um, what that kind of scale is. Really, I mean, most people will kind of work around days, but again, you can't really get hung up on days because some project manager will come along and said, well, you said this is going to take a day and it's actually taken two. Well, so what? As long as it didn't take 10 days, then you're okay. So it's not the sizing that has to be accurate because the best thing about estimates is that you can check them later on and learn from them. Not be punished by them, but learn from them. So if everything that you estimate it, that's small takes two days, then let's say small is two days. But let's not do that up front, let's do that after we've done some. Uh, and then maybe it's two and a half days. So after the first three weeks, we think all these smalls took around about two days, so we think small is roughly about two days. But then small starts getting a little bit bigger, uh, and then well, maybe it's two and a half days. But it's that, it's not 10 days. We know medium is, is like 10 days and large is like three weeks. Uh, but then maybe you actually want to say, well, okay, well, maybe the larges are too large. Maybe we should scale things down again. Uh, but all this can be gathered by how long your estimates actually took, not by your estimates that you decided in the first place. Because so once you've actually developed something, you've learned something, you've learned how long it actually did take, which is a real fact, not a guess. So you can compare the two and learn, help you learn how to be more accurate over that project. But then the only problem is when you come start to a new project, you've got new circumstances, new, possibly a new client, uh, maybe even a new team. All the things you've learned from the pre previous uh, project may not be ap applicable. So sizes, t-shirt sizes might be small, might be a day. It might be, might be three days. But then medium is always like two weeks. So it's always going to vary on the unique circumstances of each and every project that you do. Any questions so far? Um, what time is it? Do we want a break? Yeah. Yeah, cool, because I've talked for far too long. Oh, I got it. Is that the time? Uh, so, do you want a 15 minute break? So there's, uh, I don't know if there's any refreshments downstairs, but there's a cafe if you need anything. Um, uh, or you can kind of just uh, talk about these kind of issues. We'll, we'll come back, we'll do uh, an exercise, uh, again, to kind of cement some of these ideas. Uh, and um, yeah, I'll see you back in around 15 minutes. Thank you very much. Yeah, sure. Uh, the biggest problem I have is yep. not necessarily estimation, but it's ball and chain is velocity. <laughs> so it's just like, because yeah, yeah. you, your tool, I, like, so I've been, I don't know if you're going to talk about uh, Greenhopper, but I'm, I'm really into, I'm biased towards Pivotal Track at the moment, because that's basically my bread and, my, you know, bread and butter. Mm -hmm. And one of the kind of Achilles heel is there's flexibility in that you, it, estimations on experience and that makes sense and estimation is truer when you have all the knowns in place yeah and usually what i do is a larger story becomes smaller when you split out the acceptance criteria of all the scenarios that it must do mm -hmm. right so if it's performance things you can take that away and just yep. deliver on functionality and now you know how to break that down so estimations are more accurate but it's that when you're locked into a piece of software and the software has its own algorithm on velocity, it throws your days of effort. And because I overlap calendar days and days of effort, mm -hmm. so I can go at this date, we'll have an iterated MVP of, of sorts, yeah. and we will hit that fixed date and we'll hit it by if we're not making it, then I'll take out performance and stuff. So we have something testable within mm -hmm. a week, yeah. Right? yeah. But then there's always that kind of when you look at your, your burn down graphs and all of that, it's based on velocity and they become not truthful. Yeah. Because 
the flexibility of estimation. So does, I guess a, a good question would be, does Greenhopper allow you to set different contexts like using shirt sizes than points? Um, do you know what I mean? Because that just seems to me to be kind of the thing that is still unsolved and giving more flexibility on on the velocity points. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, there's, there's quite a few ways. You can kind of change, I mean, you can kind of get the, the values to represent anything you want, really. You can just use one, two, three, and they could mean small, yeah. medium, large. Um, and But also people kind of... Um, it if this does the, solve itself, yeah. if you let it, but sometimes you're you yeah. know, hit over the head saying, when's it going to be done? Mm, yeah. And it's like, you can't, do you trust velocity? Do you not trust velocity? Um, it, it, again, it's a guide. It's not, it's yeah. not a promise. It, it's, it, it's, it's, a light, it's, um, it's a probability. Uh, and so probabilities change and if you can kind of I mean a lot of people kind of instead of using burn down graphs they use burn up ones exactly. because then you can see that the fact that there's been things added to it it's very obvious that you've added things to it it's progress yeah uh, and it's very very obvious that people have you, you can see the creep uh, scope creak in that because you can see the new stories being added as well uh, and then some people in, uh, in Kanban you can take it even further uh, if you've got a Kanban board and you measure between all the different phases on the board, or you can, we can do this in Scrum as well, um, and you can create um, what they call a cumulative flow diagram. So e each story in each phase is kind of recorded in the time, and you can create this kind of big kind of build up, it's like a big kind of um, uh, burn up chart kind of thing, yeah. but with every single phase in there. So you've got uh, an RC's design test and whatever you've got there. You can see how long they're actually taking, and you can see the, the relative kind of time stories are taking in each, uh, in each role, in each phase. Yeah. And um, it gives you a better picture about what actually happened. Yeah. And the more, the more it's, it's the same with the lean startup stuff. They they try and give a, a really good understanding of what what's happened, so they can actually take that and say, well, we did all these. We know what we did, and this is the results. So then we can learn from that, rather than saying, oh, we didn't meet our targets. So okay, well, why didn't we? Uh, yeah, what can we? And what can we? Now, yeah, and what can we do to kind of make it so we don't do that kind of thing? I think like what keeps me up at night is basically. Hmm. It shouldn't do. No, you, I know, but it's just like the last unsolved piece. It's uh, yeah, I get tool, yeah, and the tool forces you to do that, and you try to circumvent it to be more mm. flexible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, a lot of people have kind of got away from Scrum because it's the, it's too much focus on velocity, and then it, and it can be used. Well, okay, well, you've got to meet your velocity. You got no, you've got to deliver software that people want. Yeah. Velocity is just an aid to do that. Yeah. It has to be a, a lesser importance. It's not a rod to beat the, the, the developers up, but it is a useful way to kind of keep them understanding their estimates, understanding how they're breaking work down as well. Greenhopper utilizes Kanban boards, right? Yes, he's got uh, it's, uh, it's got Kanban board, it's got Scrum uh, board as well, so you can oh, you can mix and match it kind of thing as well. You, you can have both the same project um, and you can do it over multiple projects now as well. I think they've just released a new version that allows you to do it. One of the interesting things I'm finding now is, um, is when you start breaking stories down, when you break them down into smaller ones, all of a sudden those could, you could say, become scope creep, yeah. right? Because then one item that someone's looking at that's assigned to them becomes five yeah. or three. And then they start going, where are all these coming from? Because one of the things that is resistant in my teams is they only pay attention to what's assigned to them. They path leads resistance. They pay attention to what they have to do, but they don't see the full picture, the whole project scope that is in PT. So you can look at the ice box stories and you mm -hmm. can see that where it's supposed to go. Yeah. But they, when they log in, they only see that. Right, okay. And then, so what happens is, is when they start having discussions and everything's progressing and everyone's going, oh, motivation, this is great, we're delivering, and then all of a sudden, tick, 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 tick. And then that's the outcome of our conversations. And then they go, well, where is the scope group coming from? Well, it was always there, yeah. but now it's more defined because okay. you know and it's becoming granular. And then, so one becomes five, and that's kind of 
email spam because you're signing. Yeah, and yeah. So yeah. I guess that's just kind of the Achilles heel of software, really. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, software is kind of flexible. It's, uh, it's the processes we kind of put in place that stop it being as flexible as it is. So the processes really need to support the, the team getting stuff done and helping the team understand uh, how long something's going to take, how to how much to break something down, and that's also like the the, the business as well because the business has to learn how to kind of define and be more specific about what they want just not just say oh we want everything just do it kind of thing because that it you need to get much more fine grained because you're trying to tell a computer what to do and that's yeah. that's still a challenge like i'm more of a i'm more seeing myself becoming a product owner than mm. a project manager yeah yeah because i am basically the bridge between clients mm. yeah. down to the build team right and so uh, because yeah if you can if you can speak the language of both uh, the business and and the developers then you'll do a fantastic job of that if you can understand the fact okay the business wants they all they always want everything uh help them understand what's really important what's the next thing they really need what's going to really drive, drive value um, it's like there's also things like cost of delay exercises where you say well cost of delay okay so you go to the business say if we don't ship this how much money will you lose okay so the, to me I would I would use Moscow for that yeah 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 exactly it's, it's just another technique so what's the most time should have but you do that with everything say and somebody said oh we really got this is really important okay well what happens if you don't deliver it yeah you can use the phone just, yeah, yeah exactly because there, there's lots of really great ideas but then people don't think them through enough and it's it's a natural it's a perfectly normal I do it all the time as well everybody does it and the business do and they've got lots of things to distract them as well so they don't have the time to think about these things really but you sometimes you need to encourage them to do that so my last question is when I by the way this is awesome by the way I'm going to oh, do this whole thanks. thing yeah. um, and a lot of it re, uh, kind of reinforces what I've been teaching my team so it's thumbs up that I'm in the right direction but um, I, I come across a lot of the literature is always about developers mm. and the developer has the mindset of kind of back end whereas most of the time it's pairing a designer to a developer yeah. and a lot of literature doesn't talk about mm. designers and it's yeah, like yeah. there's this big gap yeah. and I tend to pair a designer to a developer because I do BDD which means UI first effectively yeah. and <coughs> so you do enough design up front you yeah. get low fidelity sketches down yeah, yeah. through yeah. Yeah. and then you have something to actually start testing against and build it Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But it just seems that every time, every lecture I go to, it's always developer, developer, developer. Yeah. And there's no real structure of design, even though mm. it's there, but yeah. it's unspoken. Yeah. And it, I just it, find it that is kind of aggravating. It is, it is growing. The, like, there's a whole kind of uh, user experience community kind of growing and sort of taking, uh, taking I think flight. It's one and the same. It's yeah. like semantics, really. Yeah. And it's just it kind is. Of, yeah. It's not what's unspoken, people don't pick up, right? Mm. And they go and carry that on, and then yeah. they go, well, no one said that, well, yeah. it should have been. Yeah, I, I think very soon, I think um, the, the user experience people will will be valued even more than sort of the back end developers because it's all about user experience. As, as we get more into this kind of, the, certainly the internet age. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's not just the testers getting involved, it's people who are kind of developing that experience because everything is becoming about experience now. If I so. wanted to contact you on uh, anything, is it just Twitter that's more effective? Or? Uh, there's email. Twitter, there's, uh, email, um, or there's, uh, you know, either of those. Um, yeah, uh, you can uh, J Rocket or, uh, oops, sorry, oops, sorry, oops, sorry, oops, my bad. Oops, Either that's the one, the last one. I'm going to probably approach you for some questions because yeah, up yeah, until sure. I started chatting to Dan North a little bit, oh yeah, 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 Twitter, yeah, and ask him like I, I'm searching for this question and things seem to talk about it but don't really address it. What do you think? And then he would chime back and then it's like penny drops. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. So you know, really talking to agile coaches is awesome. But cheers. Cool. Guys. Okay. Cheers.
legacy system doesn't um, really badly written that we've inherited right and uh, partly the testings on it so obviously if we were to say test everything before you write another code mm -hmm. then we wouldn't make any progress would we because I mean that would take like several years to do that so it's very hard uh, to know exactly what to do because um, I mean, ideally, you just want to get rid of it and start again, but that's yeah, obviously that's not, not possible. Not um, so, there's several different options. There's um, some interesting literature in this um, domain driven design um, uh, book that's quite good. And um, I, I, I'll dig out a reference here, but, but basically, what they, what they suggest is to actually rewrite some of the legacy system yourself, but just the, the core part of it that actually does so that it depends what you want to do if you just want to kind of if it's just sitting there and it's going to be there for like 10 years you, you're never going to change it um, and you're not doing any development work with it then you're just kind of building it is, is required it's expected but you're, you're okay. expected to have right, okay. to be as good as, as if we have written it from scratch okay so. well then you need to impress on them that it's not because it's a legacy system There's, you need to kind of uh, make, a, make a case of why this system has a whole bunch of problems basically so this is technical debt that we have to deal with and this is why uh, so it, it doesn't have any unit tests we we don't know how it works there's uh, a lot of time it would take to change anything there's a big risk in actually changing anything because the system is not well understood and not well designed because i'm assuming those are the two biggest problems so if we change anything there's a bigger risk when we do it so you have to get the business to accept the fact that this is not going to be and never ever will be as good as the new stuff you're going to write because it's a technical debt the only way to actually make it as good as the new stuff is to write it again but but yeah. okay so it's not so it's it's an it's getting them to understand that situation so it will cost more to make any changes yes yeah so it will cost more well it's more risky to emphasize the risk right. uh, if we change something we can develop it we can develop on the system but there's more in inherent risk in what we're doing because it's a legacy system because we, we haven't built it in that particular way that we do the new stuff that's why there's a big difference 
because that also validates why you're doing things the way you're doing things now. Um, so you can, I mean, one way to do it is to to leave most of it as it is and just kind of um, redo a small part of it. So like the core engine, the core, the really valuable thing that it does, maybe consider you could consider rewriting that bit in a, or, or writing tests around that bit. Right, yeah, we, we, we do that on every change, every new bit we mm. add to it, yeah. we do in a new yeah. way. But so, we the, don't do tests yeah. necessarily on the... Yeah, I would, not, I would not do it, like, there's no point in kind of doing testing, unless you're, unless they give you the luxury and the opportunity to kind of really invest some time in that legacy system, which I'm pretty sure they won't do because they want you to do new stuff. Um, so this is a technical debt that is always going to be with you as long as that code is there. That has to be on the cards and has to be blatantly obvious to anybody who gets involved in the project. This is technical debt. You have to basically label that as technical debt. It, it does what it needs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They have to understand that it, it's going to cost more for our Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Risk yeah. Change yeah. 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 But on the other hand, it's there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's there, it does what you want. If you don't want to change it, then fine. If you want to change things, that's a big risk compared to new stuff. Uh, the the kind of uh, the middle ground of that is to rewrite the, the really really valuable stuff and extend that part that you've rewritten, and it's still kind of you just kind of use message passing or something to the other stuff or or like a message queue to, to the rest of it or or some sort of standard API that doesn't change and you kind of you take a bit out and and you actually do, rewrite it properly. Uh, so it's called like a, like the core domain of what it is. So there's a, there's a piece of it that really kind of probably delivers 80% of the value and the rest of it's yeah, kind of just yeah. fluff around it. Yeah. So it's that one piece that's really important. So you could think about rewriting that. What will be the effort in rewriting that bit? Do you understand enough of it to kind of do that relatively risk, uh, relatively easily compared to actually developing this whole thing? Because if you can kind of take that and say, okay, well, this does 80% of the work and the, the rest of it is the hor all horrible and old, but it still works. Uh, and then instead of, instead of building stuff around there, you build stuff around the new one and extend from there. Uh, yeah. So therefore, you're extending a new system. You're not. You you rebuilt the old system as a small piece of the old system, uh, as new, and then you're extending from that and adding new functionality to a new system rather than an old one. But it's still using the, all the rest of the old stuff that's not that important. Does that kind of make yeah, sense? But if you go to uh, if you look for domain-driven design, there's something called core domain. Um, and you should be able to find some stuff on there on the on the internet. But that's that's certainly one approach people use. So. because the project work be coming on late. Oh, sorry, I, I only kind of jumped in at the end of that company. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. That must be an eye opener. Um, well, if it will be, I'll start in the next few weeks. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Still doing like something wrong with my Right. Oh, okay. Yeah. You'll find a lot more scary stuff as you go along, I assume. So. Yeah. Um, I remember one guy, uh, he, um, he took over in the same kind of role. And um, he found this hideous SQL statement that when he printed out, it was actually the printout was bigger than that, that sheet of paper. And that was just one. That was just one. Of those. And he printed it on the he printed it out and put it on the wall, saying, "We don't want this anymore." 
as an example. But that's it. I mean, so it's a, a classic kind of visualization trick. It's like what people do with Kanban and stuff like that. You put something up on the wall and, and say, we don't want to see this. Uh, and it gets people talking about it. And yeah. Yeah. But you, you need to print it in a fairly small font so they don't start copying it. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah, if you see people with notepads going to go like that, that's beat them up with a stick. So. I can't get into this. Yeah. Okay. Right, okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. But it's what you do with those specs when you get them, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, uh, hopefully I'll do that. And if not, then come and ask me. <laughs> On the internet, yes. <laughs> Oh, we got pink. Uh, oh. We got enough pads. Oh, uh, oh, running. Oh, they oh, give you a pen. I knew I forgot something. There we go. Uh, oh. Oh, they give you a pen. Oh, I did, yes. So just going to do a quick exercise to get you to think about what we just talked about. Um, so spend about 10 minutes, 10-15 minutes as a, as a team uh, and talk about um, what we've just been, like the extreme programming uh, and, and anything else you're kind of already doing. So talk about how you're actually doing work and so on. And, and if, say you're all a new team and you have to kind of choose five uh, agile techniques you're actually going to use. So you're going to use unit testing, acceptance testing, so on. Uh, just pick the top five. It, so, so you've got a boss, he, he lets you do agile, but he'll let you do a bit of it. So you have, you've got five to choose, which would be the most important things you'd actually uh, choose. Write one, each one down on a post-it note, and then we'll just put them on the, wherever we're allowed to stick them, and, uh, and then compare. 
Okay, is that very simple? Has everybody got a pen? Yep. Yeah. So, 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 so five, or choose five. Dot five. Sorry, did I? Okay. You can dot five agile practices, which yeah. So which five would you choose from? So all the different techniques you can do in extreme programming. So you would do acceptance tests, uh, use stories, kind of thing. List out the like the five you think are most important. Uh, and write them down. Can you remember what they are? Is this per table or per individual? Uh, no, there's a team. Kind of discuss it as a team and go and talk about what you're actually doing, if you're actually doing anything already, kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. okay. John, can yep. we, is extreme programming allowed or do we have to break it down? We'll break it down a bit more. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Which, which kind of, yeah, pair programming and stuff like that. And, and it, think about which ones you wouldn't do, which ones are harder to kind of uh, pull in as well. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>